Section 1 of the Relations of St. Teresa of Avila. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anne Boulay. The Relations of St. Teresa of Avila. Translated by David Lewis. Relation 1 sent to st peter of alcantara in 1560 from the monastery of the incarnation avila the method of prayer i observe at present is this when i am in prayer it is very rarely that i can use the understanding because the soul becomes at once recollected remains in repose or falls into a trance so that i cannot in any way have the use of the faculties and the senses so much so that the hearing alone is left but then it does not help me to understand anything it often happens when i am not even thinking of the things of god but engaged in other matters and when prayer seems to be beyond my power whatever efforts i might make because of the great aridity i am in bodily pains contributing thereto that this recollection or elevation of spirit comes upon me so suddenly that i cannot withstand it and the fruits and blessings it brings with it are in a moment mine and this without my having had a vision or heard anything or knowing where i am except that when the soul seems to be lost i see it make great progress which i could not have made if i had labored for a whole year so great is my gain at other times certain excessive impetuosities occur accompanied with a certain fainting away of the soul for god so that i have no control over myself my life seems to have come to an end and so it makes me cry out and call upon god and this comes upon me with great vehemence sometimes i cannot remain sitting so great is the oppression of the heart and this pain comes on without my doing anything to cause it and the nature of it is such that my soul would be glad never to be without it while i live and the longings i have are longings not to live and they come on because it seems as if i must live on without being able to find any relief for relief comes from the vision of god which comes by death and death is what i cannot take and with all this my soul thinks that all except itself are filled with consolations and that all find help in their troubles but not itself the distress thus occasioned is so intense that if our lord did not relieve it by throwing it into a trance whereby all is made calm and the soul rests in a great quiet and is satisfied now by seeing something of that which it desires now by hearing other things it would seem to be impossible for it to be delivered from this pain at other times there come upon me certain desires to serve god with a vehemence so great that i cannot describe it and accompanied with a certain pain at seeing how unprofitable i am it seems to me then that there is nothing in the world neither death nor martyrdom that i could not easily endure this conviction too is not the result of any reflection but comes in a moment i am wholly changed and i know not whence cometh such great courage I think I should like to raise my voice and publish to all the world how important it is for men not to be satisfied with the common way and how great the good is that God will give us if we prepare ourselves to receive it. I say it again, these desires are such that I am melted away in myself, for I seem to desire what I cannot have. The body seems to me to hold me in prison through its inability to serve God and my state in anything for if it were not for the body i might do very great things so far as my strength would allow and thus because i see myself without any power whatever to serve god i feel this pain in a way wholly indescribable the issue is delight recollection and the consolation of god again it has happened when these longings to serve him come upon me that i wish to do penance but i am not able it would be a great relief to me and it does relieve and cheer me though what i do is almost nothing because of my bodily weakness 
and yet if i were to give way to these my longings i believe i should observe no moderation sometimes if i have to speak to any one i am greatly distressed and i suffer so much that it makes me weep abundantly for my whole desire is to be alone and solitude comforts me though at times i neither pray nor read and conversation particularly of kindred and connections seems oppressive and myself to be as a slave except when i speak to those whose conversation is of prayer and matters of the soul in these i find comfort and joy yet these occasionally are too much for me and i would rather not see them but go where i might be alone though this is not often the case for those especially who direct my conscience always console me at other times it gives me much pain that i must eat and sleep and that i see i cannot forego these things being less able to do so than any one i submit that i may serve god and thus i offer up those actions to him time seems to me too short and that i have not enough for my prayer for i should never be tired of being alone i am always wishing i had time for reading for i have been always fond of reading i read very little for when i take up a book i become recollected through the pleasure it gives me and thus my reading is turned into prayer and it is but rarely for i have many occupations and though they are good they do not give me the pleasure which reading would give and thus i am always wishing for more time and everything becomes disagreeable so i believe because i see i cannot do what i wish and desire all these desires with an increase in virtue have been given me by our lord since he raised me to this prayer of quiet and sent these raptures i find myself so improved that i look on myself as being a mass of perdition before this these raptures and visions leave me in possession of the blessings i shall now speak of and i maintain that if there be any good in me they are the occasions of it i have made a very strong resolution never to offend god not even venially i would rather die a thousand deaths than do anything of the kind knowingly i am resolved never to leave undone anything i may consider to be the more perfect or more for the honor of our lord if he who has the care of my soul and directs me tells me i may do it cost me what pain it might i would not leave such an act undone for all the treasure of the world if i were to do so i do not think i could have the face to ask anything of god our lord or to make my prayer and yet for all this i have many faults and imperfections i am obedient to my confessor though imperfectly but if i know that he wishes or commands anything i would not leave that undone as far as i understand it if i did so i should think myself under a grievous delusion i have a longing for poverty though not free from imperfection however i believe if i had wealth i would not reserve any revenue nor hoard money for myself nor do i care for it i wish to have only what is necessary nevertheless i feel that i am very defective in this virtue for though i desire nothing for myself i should like to have something to give away still i desire no revenue nor anything for myself in almost all the visions i have had i have found good if it be not a delusion of satan herein i submit myself to the judgment of my confessors as to fine and beautiful things such as water fields perfume music etc i think i would rather not have them so great is the difference between them and what i am in the habit of seeing and so all pleasure in them is gone from me hence it is that i care not for them unless it be at the first sight they never make any further impression to me they seem but dirt if i speak or converse with people in the world for i cannot help it even about prayer and if the conversation be long though to pass away the time i am under great restraint if it not be necessary for it gives me much pain amusements of which i used to be fond and worldly things are all disagreeable to me now and i cannot look at them the longings which i have said i have of loving and serving and seeing god 
are not helped by any reflections, as formerly, when I thought I was very devout, and shed many tears. But they flow out of a certain fire and heat, so excessive, that, I repeat it, if God did not relieve them by throwing me into a trance, wherein the soul seems to find itself satisfied, I believe my life would come to an end at once. When I see persons making great progress, and thus resolved, detached, and courageous, I love them much, and I should like to have my conversation with such persons, and I think they would help me on. People who are afraid, and seemingly cautious in those things, the doing of which is perfectly reasonable here, seem to vex me, and drive me to pray to God and the saints, to make them undertake such things as these which now frighten us. Not that I am good at anything myself, but because I believe that God helps those who, for his sake, apply themselves to great things, and that he never abandons any one who puts his trust in him only. And I should like to find any one who would help me to believe so, and to be without thought about food and raiment, but leave it all in the hands of God. This leaving in the hands of God, the supply of all I need, is not to be understood as excluding all labor on my part, but merely solicitude. I mean, the solicitude of care. And since I have attained to this liberty, it goes well with me, and I labor to forget myself as much as I can. I do not think it a year ago since our Lord gave me this liberty. Vain glory, glory be to God, so far as I know, there is no reason why I should have any, for I see plainly that in these things, which God sends me, I have no part myself. On the contrary, God makes me conscious of my own wretchedness, for whatever reflections I might be able to make, I could never come to the knowledge of such deep truths, as I attain to in a single rapture. When I speak of these things, a few days after, they seem to me as if they had happened to another person. Previously, I thought it a wrong to me that they should be known to others, but I see now that I am not therefore any better, but rather worse, seeing that I make so little progress after receiving mercies so great. And certainly, in every way, it seems to me that there was not in the world anybody worse than myself, and so the virtues of others seem to me much more meritorious than mine, and that I do nothing myself but receive graces, and that God must give to others at once all that he is now giving unto me, and I pray him not to reward me in this life. And so I believe that God has led me along this way, because I am weak and wicked. When I am in prayer, and even almost always when I am able to reflect at all, I cannot, even if I tried, pray to God for rest, or desire it. For I see that his life was one of suffering, and that I ask him to send me, giving me the first grace to bear it. Everything of this kind, and of the highest perfection, seems to make so deep an impression on me in prayer, that I am amazed at the sight of truth so great and so clear, that the things of the world seem to be folly, and so it is necessary for me to take pains, to reflect on the way I demeaned myself formerly in the things of the world, for it seems to me folly to feel for deaths and the troubles of the world, at least that sorrow for, or love of, kindred and friends should last long. I say I have to take pains when I am considering what I was and what I used to feel. If I see people do anything which clearly seems to be a sin, I cannot make up my mind that they have offended God, and if I dwell upon this at all, which happens rarely or never, I never can make up my mind, though I see it plainly enough. It seems to me that everybody is as anxious to serve God as I am, and herein, God has been very gracious unto me, for I never dwell on an evil deed, to remember it afterwards. And if I do remember it, I see some virtue or other in that person. In this way, these things never weary me, except generally. But heresies do. They distress me very much, and almost always when I think of them, they seem to me to be the only trouble which should be felt. And also I feel, when I see people who used to give themselves to prayer fall away, this gives me pain, but not much, because I strive not to dwell upon it. 
I find also that I am improved in the matter of that excessive neatness which I was wont to observe, though not wholly delivered from it. I do not discern that I am always mortified in this. Sometimes, however, I do. All this I have described, together with a very constant dwelling in thought on God, is the ordinary state of my soul, so far as I can understand it. And if I must be busy about something else, without my seeking it, as I said before, I know not who makes me awake, and this not always, only when I am busy with things of importance, and such, glory be to God, only at intervals demand my attention, and do not occupy me at all times. For some days, they are not many, however, for three or four or five, all my good and fervent thoughts and my visions seem to be withdrawn, yea, even forgotten, so that, if I were to seek for it, I know of no good that can ever have been in me. It seems to have been all a dream, or at least, I can call nothing to mind." bodily pains at the same time distress me my understanding is troubled so that i cannot think at all about god neither do i know under what law i live if i read anything i do not understand it i seem to be full of faults and without any resolution whatever to practise virtue and the great resolution i used to have is come to this that i seem to be unable to resist the least temptation or slander of the world it suggests itself to me, then, that I am good for nothing, if any one would have me undertake more than the common duties. I give way to sadness, thinking that I have deceived all those who trusted me at all. I should like to hide myself where nobody could see me, but my desire for solitude arises from want of courage, not from love of virtue. It seems to me that I should like to dispute with all who contradict me. I am under the influence of these impressions, only God has been so gracious unto me, that I do not offend more frequently than I was wont to do, nor do I ask him to deliver me from them, but only, if it be his will, I should always suffer thus, to keep me from offending him, and I submit myself to his will, with my whole heart, and I see that it is a very great grace bestowed upon me, that he does not keep me constantly in this state. One thing astonishes me, it is that, while I am in this state, through a single word of those I am in the habit of hearing, or a single vision, or a little self-recollection, lasting but an Ave Maria, or through my drawing near to communicate, I find my soul and body so calm, so sound, the understanding so clear, and myself possessing all the strength and all the good desires I usually have and this I have had experience of very often, at least when I go to communion. It is more than six months ago that I felt a clear improvement in my bodily health, and that occasionally brought about through raptures, and I find it lasts sometimes more than three hours. At other times I am much stronger for a whole day, and I do not think it is fancy, for I have considered the matter and reflected on it. Accordingly, when I am thus recollected, I fear no illness. The truth is, that when I pray, as I was accustomed to do before, I feel no improvement. All these things of which I am speaking make me believe that it comes from God, for when I see what I once was, that I was in the way of being lost, and that soon my soul certainly is astonished at these things, without knowing whence these virtues came to me. I do not know myself, and saw that all was a gift, and not the fruit of my labors. I understand in all truthfulness and sincerity, and see that I am not deluded, that it has been not only the means of drawing me to God in his service, but of saving me also from hell. This my confessors know, who have heard my general confession. Also, when I see any one who knows anything about me, I wish to let him know my whole life, because my honor seems to me to consist in the honor of our Lord, and I care for nothing else. This he knows well, or I am very blind. For neither honor, nor life, nor praise, nor good either of body or of soul, can interest me, nor do I seek or desire any advantage, only his glory. I cannot believe that Satan has sought so many means of making my soul advance, in order to lose it after all. 
I do not hold him to be so foolish. Nor can I believe it of God, though I have deserved to fall into delusions because of my sins, that he has left unheeded so many prayers of so many good people for two years, and I do nothing else but ask everybody to pray to our Lord, that he would show me if this be for his glory, or lead me by another way. I do not believe that these things would be permitted by his majesty to be always going on if they were not his work. These considerations, and the reasons of so many saintly men, give me courage when I am under the pressure of fear that they are not from God, I being so wicked myself. But when I am in prayer, and during those days when I am in repose, and my thoughts fixed on God, if all the learned and holy men in the world came together and put me to all conceivable tortures, and I too, desirous of agreeing with them, they could not make me believe that this is the work of Satan, for I cannot. And when they would have had me believe it, I was afraid, seeing who it was that said so. And I thought that they must be saying what was true, and that I, being what I was, must have been deluded. But all they have said to me was destroyed by the first word, or recollection, or vision that came, and I was able to resist no longer, and believed it was from God. However, I can think that Satan now and then may intermeddle here, and so it is, as I have seen and said. But he produces different results, nor can he, as it seems to me, deceive any one possessed of any experience. Nevertheless, I say that, though I do certainly believe this to be from God, I would never do anything, for any consideration whatever, that is not judged by him who has the charge of my soul, to be for the better service of our Lord, and I never had any intention but to obey without concealing anything, for that is my duty. I am very often rebuked for my faults, and that in such a way as to pierce me to the very quick, and I am warned when there is, or when there may be, any danger in what I am doing. These rebukes and warnings have done me much good, in often reminding me of my former sins, which make me exceedingly sorry. I have been very long, but this is the truth, that, when I rise from my prayer, I see that I have received blessings which seem too briefly described. Afterwards I fall into many imperfections, and am unprofitable and very wicked. And perhaps I have no perception of what is good, but am deluded. Still, the difference in my life is notorious, and compels me to think over all I have said, I mean, that which I verily believe I have felt. These are the perfections which I feel our Lord has wrought in me, who am so wicked and so imperfect. I refer it all to your judgment, my father, for you know the whole state of my soul. End of section one. Section 2 of the Relations of St. Teresa of Avila, translated by David Lewis. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Relation 2 To one of her confessors, from the house of Doña Luisa de la Cerda, in 1562. Jesus, I think it more than a year since this was written, God has all this time protected me with his hand, so that I have not become worse. On the contrary, I see a great change for the better in all I have said. May he be praised for it all. The visions and revelations have not ceased, but they are of a much higher kind. Our Lord has taught me a way of prayer, wherein I find myself far more advanced, more detached from the things of this life, more courageous, and more free. I fall into a trance more frequently, for these ecstasies at times come upon me with great violence, and in such a way as to be outwardly visible. I have no power to resist them. And even when I am with others, for they come in such a way as admits of no disguising them, unless it be by letting people suppose that, as I am subject to disease of the heart, they are fainting fits. I take great pains, however, to resist them when they are coming on. Sometimes I cannot do it. As to poverty, God seems to have wrought great things in me, 
for I would willingly be without even what is necessary, unless given me as an alms, and therefore my longing is extreme that I may be in such a state, as to depend on alms alone for my food. It seems to me that to live, when I am certain of food and raiment without fail, is not so complete an observance of my vow, or of the counsel of Christ, as it would be to live where no revenue is possessed, and I should be in want at times. And as to the blessings that come with true poverty, they seem to me to be great, and I would not miss them. Many times I find myself with such great faith, that I do not think God will ever fail those who serve him, and without any doubt whatever, that there is, or can be, any time in which his words are not fulfilled. I cannot persuade myself to the contrary, nor can I have any fear. And so, when they advise me to accept an endowment, I feel it keenly, and betake myself unto God. I think I am much more compassionate towards the poor than I used to be, having a great pity for them, and a desire to help them. For if I regarded only my good will, I should give them even the habit I wear. I am not fastidious with respect to them, even if I had to do with them or touch them with my hands. And this I now see is a gift of God. For though I used to give alms for his love, I had no natural compassion. I am conscious of a distinct improvement herein. As to the evil speaking directed against me, which is considerable and highly injurious to me, and done by many, I find myself herein also very much the better. I think that what they say makes scarcely any more impression upon me than it would upon an idiot. I think at times, and nearly always, that it is just. I feel it so little, that I see nothing in it that I might offer to God, as I learn by experience, that my soul gains greatly thereby. On the contrary, the evil speaking seems to be a favor. And thus, the first time I go to prayer, I have no ill feeling against them. The first time I hear it, it creates in me a little resistance, but it neither disturbs nor moves me. On the contrary, when I see others occasionally disturbed, I am sorry for them. So it is, I put myself out of the question, for all the wrongs of this life seem to me so light, that it is not possible to feel them, because I imagine myself to be dreaming, and see that all this will be nothing when I am awake. God is giving me more earnest desires, a greater love of solitude, a much greater detachment, as I said, with the visions. By these, he has made me know what all that is, even if I gave up all the friends I have, both men and women and kindred. This is the least part of it. My kindred are rather a very great weariness to me. I leave them in all freedom and joy, provided it be to render the least service unto God, and thus on every side I find peace. Certain things, about which I have been warned in prayer, have been perfectly verified. Thus, considering the graces received from God, I find myself very much better. But, considering my service to Him in return, I am exceedingly worthless, for I have received greater consolation than I have given, though sometimes that gives me grievous pain. My penance is very scanty, the respect shown me great, much against my will very often. However, in a word, I see that I live an easy, not a penitential life. God help me as he can. It is now nine months, more or less, since I wrote this with mine own hand. Since then I have not turned my back on the graces which God has given me. I think I have received, so far as I can see, a much greater liberty of late. Hitherto I thought I had need of others, and I had more reliance on worldly helps. Now I clearly understand that all men are bunches of dried rosemary, and that there is no safety in leaning on them, for if they are pressed by contradictions or evil speaking, they break down. And so I know by experience that the only way not to fall is to cling to the cross, and put our trust in him who was nailed thereto. I find him a real friend, and with him I find myself endowed with such might that, God never failing me, I think I should be able to withstand the whole world if it were against me. 
Having a clear knowledge of this truth, I used to be very fond of being loved by others. Now I do not care for that. Yea, rather their love seems to weary me in some measure, excepting theirs who take care of my soul, or theirs to whom I think I do good. Of the former I wish to be loved, in order that they may bear with me, and of the latter, that they may be more inclined to believe me when I tell them that all is vanity. In the very grievous trials, persecutions, and contradictions of these months, God gave me great courage, and the more grievous they were, the greater the courage, without weariness in suffering. Not only had I no ill feeling against those who spoke evil of me, but I had, I believe, conceived a deeper affection for them. I know not how it was, certainly it was a gift from the hand of our Lord. When I desire anything, I am accustomed naturally to desire it with some vehemence. Now my desires are so calm, that I do not even feel that I am pleased when I see them fulfilled. Sorrow and joy, excepting in that which relates to prayer, are so moderated, that I seem to be without sense, and in that state I remain for some days. The vehement longings to do penance which come, and have come, upon me are great, and if I do any penance, I feel it to be so slight in comparison with that longing, that I regard it sometimes, and almost always, as a special consolation. However, I do but little, because of my great weakness. It is a very great pain to me very often, and at this moment most grievous, that I must take food, particularly if I am in prayer. It must be very great, for it makes me weep much, and speak the language of affliction, almost without being aware of it, and that is what I am not in the habit of doing, for I do not remember that I ever did so in the very heaviest trials of my life. I am not a woman in these things, for I have a hard heart. I feel in myself a very earnest desire, more so than usual, that God may find those who will serve him, particularly learned men, in all detachment, and who will not cleave to anything of this world, for I see it is all a mockery. For when I see the great needs of the church, I look upon it as a mockery to be distressed about aught else. I do nothing but pray to God for such men, because I see that one person, who is wholly perfect in the true fervor of the love of God, will do more good than many who are lukewarm. In matters concerning the faith, my courage seems to me much greater. I think I could go forth alone by myself against all the Lutherans, and convince them of their errors. I feel very keenly the loss of so many souls. I see many persons making great progress. I see clearly it was the pleasure of God that such progress should have been helped by me, and I perceive that my soul, of his goodness, grows daily more and more in his love. I think I could not be led away by vainglory, even if I seriously tried, and I do not see how I could imagine any one of my virtues to be mine, for it is not long since I was for many years without any at all, and now, so far as I am concerned, I do nothing but receive graces, without rendering any service in return, being the most worthless creature in the world. And so it is that I consider at times how all, excepting myself, make progress. I am good for nothing in myself. This is not humility only, but the simple truth. And the knowledge of my being so worthless makes me sometimes think with fear that I must be under some delusion. Thus I see clearly that all my gain has come through the revelations and the raptures, in which I am nothing myself and do no more to effect them, than the canvas does for the picture painted on it. This makes me feel secure and be at rest, and I place myself in the hands of God, and trust my desires, for I know for certain that my desires are to die for him, and to lose all ease, and that whatever may happen. There are days wherein I remember times without number the words of St. Paul, though certainly they are not true of me, that I have neither life, nor speech, nor will of my own, but that there is one in me, by whom I am directed and made strong, and I am, as it were, beside myself, and thus life is a very grievous burden to me. 
and the greatest oblation i make to god as the highest service on my part is that i when i feel it so painful to be absent from him am willing to live on for the love of him i would have my life so full of great tribulations and persecutions now that i am unprofitable i should like to suffer and i would endure all the tribulations in the world to gain ever so little more merit i mean by a more perfect doing of his will everything that i have learnt in prayer though it may be two years previously i have seen fulfilled what i see and understand of the grandeurs of god and of the way he has shown me is so high that i scarcely ever begin to think of them but my understanding fails me for i am as one that sees things far higher than i can understand and i become recollected god so keeps me from offending him that i am verily amazed at times i think i discern the great care he takes of me without my taking scarcely any care at all being as i was before these things happened to me a sea of wickedness and sins and without a thought that i was mistress enough of myself to leave them undone and the reason why i would have this known is that the great power of god might be made manifest unto him be praised for ever and ever amen jesus this relation here set forth not in my handwriting is one that i gave to my confessor and which he with his own hand copied without adding or diminishing a word he was a most spiritual man and a theologian i discussed the state of my soul with him and he with other learned men among whom was father mancio they found nothing in it that is not in perfect agreement with the holy writings this makes me calm now though while god is leading me by this way i feel that it is necessary for me to put no trust whatever in myself and so i have always done though it is painful enough you my father will be careful that all this goes under the seal of confession according to my request end of section two Section 3 of the Relations of St. Teresa of Avila, translated by David Lewis. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Relation 3 of various graces granted to the saint from the year 1568 to 1571 inclusive. When I was in the monastery of Toledo, and some people were advising me not to allow any but noble persons to be buried there, our Lord said to me, Thou wilt be very inconsistent, my daughter, if thou regardest the laws of the world. Look at me, poor and despised of men. Are the great people of the world likely to be great in my eyes? Or is it dissent or virtue that is to make you esteemed? After communion, the second day of Lent, in St. Joseph of Malagon, our Lord Jesus Christ appeared to me in an imaginary vision, as he is wont to do, and when I was looking upon him, I saw that he had on his head, instead of the crown of thorns, a crown of great splendor, over the part where the wounds of that crown must have been. And as I have a great devotion to the crowning with thorns, I was exceedingly consoled, and began to think how great the pain must have been because of the many wounds and to be sorrowful our lord told me not to be sad because of those wounds but for the many wounds which men inflict upon him now i asked him what i could do by way of reparation for i was resolved to do anything he replied this is not the time for rest then i must hasten on the foundations for he would take his rest with the souls which entered the monasteries that i must admit all who offered themselves because there were many souls that did not serve him because they had no place wherein to do it that those monasteries which were to be founded in small towns should be like this that the merit of those in them would be as great if they only desire to do that which is done in the other houses that i must contrive to put them all under the jurisdiction of one superior and take care that anxieties about means of bodily maintenance did not destroy interior peace for he would help us so that we should never be in want of food 
a special care was to be had of the sick sisters the prioress who did not provide for and comfort the sick was like the friends of job he sent them sickness for the good of their souls and careless superiors risked the patience of their nuns i was to write the history of the foundation of the monasteries i was thinking how there was nothing to write about in reference to the foundation of medina when he asked me what more did i want to see than that the foundation there was miraculous by this he meant to say that he alone had done it when it seemed impossible i resolved to execute his commands our lord told me something i was to tell another and as i was considering how i did not understand it at all though i prayed to him and was thinking it might be from satan he said to me that it was not and that he himself would warn me when the time came once when i was thinking how much more purely they live who withdraw themselves from all business and how ill it goes with me and how many faults i must be guilty of when i have business to transact i heard this it cannot be otherwise my daughter but strive thou always after a good intention in all things and detachment lift up thine eyes to me and see that all thine actions may resemble mine thinking how it was that i scarcely ever fell into a trance of late in public i heard this it is not necessary now thou art sufficiently esteemed for my purpose we are considering the weakness of the wicked one tuesday after the ascension having prayed for a while after communion in great distress because i was so distracted that i could fix my mind on nothing i complained of our poor nature to our lord the fire began to kindle in my soul and i saw as it seemed to me the most holy trinity distinctly presented in an intellectual vision whereby my soul understood through a certain representation as a figure of the truth so far as my dullness could understand how god is three and one and thus it seemed to me that all the three persons spoke to me that they were distinctly present in my soul saying unto me that from that day forth i should see that my soul had grown better in three ways and that each one of the three persons had bestowed on me a distinct grace in charity in suffering joyfully in a sense of that charity in my soul accompanied with fervor i learnt the meaning of those words of our lord that the three divine persons will dwell in the soul that is in a state of grace afterwards giving thanks to our lord for so great a mercy and finding myself utterly unworthy of it i asked his majesty with great earnestness how it was that he after showing such mercies to me let me go out of his hand and allowed me to become so wicked for on the previous day i had been in great distress on account of my sins which i had set before me i saw clearly then how much our lord on his part had done ever since my infancy to draw me to himself by means most effectual and yet that all had failed then i had a clear perception of the surpassing love of god for us in that he forgives us all this when we turn to him and for me more than any other person for many reasons the vision of the three divine persons one god made so profound an impression on my soul that if it had continued it would have been impossible for me not to be recollected in so divine a company what i saw and heard besides is beyond my power to describe once when i was about to communicate it was shortly before i had this vision the host being still in the chaborum for it had not yet been given me i saw something like a dove which moved its wings with a sound it disturbed me so much and so carried me away out of myself that it was with the utmost difficulty i received the host all this took place in saint joseph of avila it was father francis salcedo who was giving me the most holy sacrament hearing mass another day i saw our lord glorious in the host he said to me that his sacrifice was acceptable unto him i heard this once the time will come when many miracles will be wrought in this church it will be called the holy church it was in saint joseph of avila in the year fifteen seventy one i retain to this day which is the commemoration of saint paul the presence of the three persons of which i spoke in the beginning 
they are present almost continually in my soul i being accustomed to the presence of jesus christ only always thought that the vision of the three persons was in some degree a hindrance though i know the three persons are but one god to-day while thinking of this our lord said to me that i was wrong in imagining that those things which are peculiar to the soul can be represented by those of the body i was to understand that they were very different and that the soul had a capacity for great fruition it seemed to me as if this were shown to me thus as water penetrates and is drunk in by the sponge so it seemed to me did the divinity fill my soul which in a certain sense had the fruition and possession of the three persons and i heard him say also labor thou not to hold me within thyself enclosed but enclose thou thyself within me it seemed to me that i saw the three persons within my soul and communicating themselves to all creatures abundantly without ceasing to be with me a few days after this thinking whether they were right who disapproved of my going out to make new foundations and whether it would not be better for me if i occupied myself always with prayer i heard this during this life the true gain consists not in striving after greater joy in me but in doing my will it seemed to me considering what st paul says about women how they should stay at home people reminded me lately of this and indeed i had heard it before it might be the will of god i should do so too he said to me tell them they are not to follow one part of scripture by itself without looking to the other parts also perhaps if they could they would like to tie my hands one day after the octave of the visitation in one of the hermitages of mount carmel praying to god for one of my brothers i said to our lord i do not know whether it was only in thought or not for my brother was in a place where his salvation was in peril if i saw one of thy brethren o lord in this danger what would i not do to help him it seemed to me there was nothing that i could do which i would not have done our lord said to me o oh, daughter daughter the nuns of the incarnation are thy sisters and thou holdest back take courage then behold this is what i would have thee do it is not so difficult as it seems and though it seems to thee that by going thither thy foundations will be ruined yet it is by thy going that both these and the monastery of the incarnation will gain resist not for my power is great once when thinking of the great penance practiced by doña catalina de cardona and how i might have done more considering the desires which our lord had given me at times if it had not been for my obedience to my confessors i asked myself whether it would not be as well if i disobeyed them for the future in this matter our lord said to me no daughter thou art on the sound and safe road seest thou all her penance i think more of thy obedience once when i was in prayer he showed me a certain kind of intellectual vision the condition of a soul in a state of grace in its company i saw by intellectual vision the most holy trinity from whose companionship the soul derived a power which was a dominion over the whole earth i understood the meaning of those words in the canticle let my beloved come into his garden and eat he showed me also the condition of a soul in sin utterly powerless like a person tied and bound and blindfold who though anxious to see yet cannot being unable to walk or to hear and in grievous obscurity i was so exceedingly sorry for such souls that to deliver only one any trouble seemed to me light i thought it impossible for any one who saw this as i saw it and i can hardly explain it willingly to forfeit so great a good or continue in so evil a state one day in very great distress about the state of the order and casting about for means to succor it our lord said to me do thou what is in thy power and leave me to myself and be not disquieted by anything rejoice in the blessing thou hast received for it is a very great one my father is pleased with thee and the holy ghost loves thee 
thou art ever desiring trials and on the other hand declining them i order things according to what i know thy will is and not according to thy sensuality and weakness be strong for thou seest how i help thee i have wished thee to gain this crown thou shalt see the order of the virgin greatly advanced in thy days i heard this from our lord about the middle of february fifteen seventy one on the eve of saint sebastian the first year of my being in the monastery of the incarnation as prioress there at the beginning of the salve i saw the mother of god descend with a multitude of angels to the stall of the prioress where the image of our lady is and sit there herself i think i did not see the image then but only our lady she seemed to be like that picture of her which the countess gave me but i had no time to ascertain this because i fell at once into a trance multitudes of angels seemed to me to be above the canopies of the stalls and on the desks in front of them but i saw no bodily forms for the vision was intellectual she remained there during the salve and said to me thou hast done well to place me here i will be present when the sisters sing the praises of my son and will offer them to him after this i remained in that prayer which i still practice and which is that of keeping my soul in the company of the most holy trinity and it seemed to me that the person of the father drew me to himself and spoke to me most comfortable words among them were these while showing how he loved me i give thee my son and the holy ghost and the virgin what canst thou give me on the octave of the holy ghost our lord was gracious unto me and gave me hopes of this house that it would go on improving i mean the souls that are in it on the feast of the magdalene our lord again confirmed a grace i had received in toledo electing me in the absence of a certain person in her place in the monastery of the incarnation and in the second year of my being prioress there on the octave of saint martin when i was going to communion the father friar john of the cross it was he who was giving me the most holy sacrament divided the host between me and another sister i thought it was done not because there was any want of hosts but that he wished to mortify me because i had told him how much i delighted in hosts of a large size yet i was not ignorant that the size of the host is of no moment for i knew that our lord is whole and entire in the smallest particle his majesty said to me have no fear my daughter for no one will be able to separate thee from me giving me to understand that the size of the host mattered not then appearing to me as on other occasions in an imaginary vision most interiorly he held out his right hand and said behold this nail it is the pledge of thy being my bride from this day forth until now thou hast not merited it from henceforth thou shalt regard my honour not only as of one who is thy creator king and god but as thine my veritable bride my honour is thine and thine is mine this grace had such an effect on me that i could not contain myself i became as one that is foolish and said to our lord either ennoble my vileness or cease to bestow such mercies on me for certainly i do not think that nature can bear them i remained thus the whole day as one utterly beside herself afterwards i became conscious of great progress and greater shame and distress to see that i did nothing in return for graces so great our lord said this to me one day thinkest thou my daughter that meriting lies in fruition no merit lies only in doing in suffering and in loving you never heard that st paul had the fruition of heavenly joys more than once while he was often in sufferings thou seest how my whole life was full of dolors and only on mount tabor hast thou heard of me in glory do not suppose when thou seest my mother hold me in her arms that she had that joy unmixed with heavy sorrows from the time that simeon spoke to her my father made her see in clear light all i had to suffer the grand saints of the desert as they were led by god 
so also did they undergo heavy penances. Besides, they waged serious war with the devil and with themselves, and much of their time passed away without any spiritual consolation whatever. Believe me, my daughter, his trials are the heaviest whom my father loves most. Trials are the measure of his love. How can I show my love for thee, better than by desiring for thee what I desired for myself? Consider my wounds. Thy pains will never reach them. This is the way of truth. Thus shalt thou help me to weep over the ruin of those who are in the world, for thou knowest how all their desires, anxieties, and thoughts tend the other way. When I began my prayer that day, my headache was so violent that I thought I could not possibly go on. Our Lord said to me, Behold now the reward of suffering, as thou, on account of thy health, wert unable to speak to me, I spoke to thee and comforted thee. Certainly so it was, for the time of my recollection lasted about an hour and a half, more or less. It was then that he spoke to me the words I have just related, together with all the others. I was not able to distract myself, neither knew I where I was. My joy was so great as to be indescribable. My headache was gone, and I was amazed, and I had a longing for suffering. He also told me to keep in mind the words he said to his apostles. The servant is not greater than his Lord. End of section 3 Section 4 of the Relations of St. Teresa of Avila Translated by David Lewis This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Relation four of the graces the saint received in Salamanca at the end of Lent, 1571. I found myself the whole of yesterday in great desolation, and, except at communion, did not feel that it was the day of the resurrection. Last night, being with the community, I heard one of them singing how hard it is to be living away from God. As I was then suffering, the effect of that singing on me was such that a numbness began in my hands, and no efforts of mine could hinder it. But as I go out of myself in raptures of joy, so then my soul was thrown into a trance through the excessive pain, and remained entranced. And until this day I had not felt this. A few days previously, I thought that the vehement impulses were not so great as they used to be, and now it seems to me that the reason is what I have described. I know not if it is so. Hitherto the pain had not gone so far as to make me beside myself, and as it is so unendurable, and as I retain the control of my senses, it made me utter loud cries beyond my power to restrain. Now that it has grown, it has reached this point of piercing me, and I understand more of that piercing which Our Lady suffered. For until today, as I have just said, I never knew what that piercing was. My body was so bruised, that I suffer even now when I am writing this, for my hands are as if the joints are loosened and in pain. You, my father, will tell me when you see me, whether this trance be the effect of suffering, or whether I felt it, or whether I am deceived. I was in this great pain till this morning, and, being in prayer, I fell into a profound trance, and it seemed to me that our Lord had taken me up in spirit to his Father, and said to him, Whom thou hast given to me, I give to thee. And he seemed to draw me near to himself. This is not an imaginary vision, but one most certain, and so spiritually subtle that it cannot be explained. He spoke certain words to me which I do not remember. Some of them referred to his grace, which he bestows on me. He kept me by him for some time. As you, my father, went away yesterday so soon, and I consider the many affairs which detain you, so that it is impossible for me to have recourse to you, for comfort even when necessary, for I see that your occupations are most urgent, I was for some time in pain and sadness. As I was then in desolation, as I said before, that helped me, and as nothing on earth, I thought, had any attractions for me, 
I had a scruple, and feared I was beginning to lose that liberty. This took place last night, and today our Lord answered my doubt, and said to me, that I was not to be surprised, for as men seek for companions with whom they may speak of their sensual satisfactions, so the soul, when there is any one who understands it, seeks those to whom it may communicate its pleasures and pains, and is sad and mourns when it can find none. He said to me, Thou art prosperous now, and thy works please me. As he remained with me for some time, I remembered that I had told you, my father, that these visions passed quickly away. He said to me, that there was a difference between these and the imaginary visions, and that there could not be an invariable law concerning the graces he bestowed on us, for it was expedient to give them now in one way, now in another. After communion I saw our Lord most distinctly close beside me, and he began to comfort me with great sweetness, and said to me, among other things, Thou beholdest me present, my daughter, it is I, show me thy hands. And to me he seemed to take them and put them to his side, and said, Behold my wounds, thou art not without me, finish the short course of thy life. By some things he said to me, I understood that, after his ascension, he never came down to earth except in the most holy sacrament to communicate himself to any one. He said to me, that when he rose again, he showed himself to Our Lady, because she was in great trouble, for sorrow had so pierced her soul, that she did not even recover herself at once, in order to have the fruition of that joy. By this I saw how different was my piercing. But what must that of the Virgin have been? He remained long with her then, because it was necessary to console her. On Palm Sunday, at communion, I was in a deep trance, so much so, that I was not able even to swallow the host, and still having it in my mouth, when I had come a little to myself, I verily believed that my mouth was all filled with blood, and my face and my whole body seemed to be covered with it, as if our Lord had been shedding it at that moment. I thought it was warm, and the sweetness I then felt was exceedingly great, and our Lord said to me, Daughter, my will is that my blood should profit thee, and be not thou afraid that my compassion will fail thee. I shed it in much suffering, and, as thou seest, thou hast the fruition of it in great joy. I reward thee well for the pleasure thou givest me to-day. He said this because I had been in the habit of going to communion, if possible, on this day for more than thirty years, and of laboring to prepare my soul to be the host of our Lord. For I consider the cruelty of the Jews to be very great, after giving him so grand a reception, in letting him go so far for supper. And as I used to picture him as remaining with me, and truly in the poor lodging, as I see now, and thus I used to have such foolish thoughts, they must have been acceptable to our Lord, for this was one of the visions which I regard as most certain, and accordingly, it has been a great blessing to me in the matter of communion. Previous to this, I had been, I believe, for three days in that great pain, which I feel sometimes more than at others, because I am away from God, and during those days it had been very great, and seemingly more than I could bear. Being thus exceedingly wearied by it, I saw it was late to take my collation, nor could I do so. For if I did not take it a little earlier, it occasions great weakness because of my sickness. And then, doing violence to myself, I took up some bread to prepare for collation, and on the instant Christ appeared, and seemed to be breaking the bread, and putting it into my mouth. He said to me, eat, my daughter, and bear it as well as thou canst. I condole with thee in thy suffering, but it is good for thee now. My pain was gone, and I was comforted, for he seemed to be really with me then, and the whole of the next day, and with this my desires were then satisfied. The word condole made me strong, for now I do not think I am suffering at all. End of section 4 
Section 5 of the Relations of St. Teresa of Avila, translated by David Lewis. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Relation 5. Observations on Certain Points of Spirituality. What is it that distresses thee, little sinner? Am I not thy God? Dost thou not see how ill I am treated here? If thou lovest me, why art thou not sorry for me? Daughter, light is very different from darkness. I am faithful. No one will be lost without knowing it. He must be deceiving himself who relies on spiritual sweetnesses. The true safety lies in the witness of a good conscience. But let no one think that, of himself, he can abide in the light any more than he can hinder the natural night from coming on, for that depends on my grace. The best means he can have for retaining the light is the conviction in his soul that he can do nothing of himself, and that it comes from me. For, even if he were in the light, the instant I withdraw, night will come. True humility is this, the soul's knowing what itself can do, and what I can do. Do not neglect to write down the counsels I give thee, that thou mayest not forget them. Thou seekest to have the counsels of men in writing. Why, then, thinkest thou that thou art wasting time in writing down those I give thee? The time will come when thou shalt require them all. On Union Do not suppose, my daughter, that to be near to me is union, for they who sin against me are near me, though they do not wish it. Nor is union the joys and comforts of union, though they be of the very highest kind, and though they come from me. These very often are means of winning souls, even if they are not in the state of grace. When I heard this, I was in a high degree lifted up in spirit. Our Lord showed me what the spirit was, and what the state of the soul was then, and the meaning of the words of the Magnificat. Exultivit spiritus meus. He showed me that the spirit was the higher part of the will. To return to union, I understood it to be a spirit, pure and raised up above all the things of earth, with nothing remaining in it that would swerve from the will of God, being a spirit and a will resigned to his will, and in detachment from all things, occupied in God in such a way as to leave no trace of any love of self, or of any created thing whatever. Thereupon I considered that, if this be union, it comes to this, that as my soul is always abiding in this resolution, we can say of it that it is always in this prayer of union. And yet it is true that the union lasts but a very short time. It was suggested to me that, as to living in justice, meriting and making progress, it will be so. But it cannot be said that the soul is in union, as it is when in contemplation, and I thought I understood, yet not by words heard, that the dust of our wretchedness, faults and imperfections, wherein we bury ourselves, is so great, that it is not possible to live in such pureness as the spirit is, when in union with God, raised up and out of our wretched misery. And I think, if it be union to have our will in spirit, in union with the will and spirit of God, that it is not possible for any one not in a state of grace to attain thereto, and I have been told so. Accordingly, I believe it is very difficult to know when the soul is in union. To have that knowledge is a special grace of God, because nobody can tell whether he is in a state of grace or not. You will show me in writing, my father, what you think of this, and how I am wrong, and send me this paper back. I had read in a book that it is an imperfection to possess pictures well painted, and I would not, therefore, retain in my cell one that I had, and also, because I had read this, I thought that it was poverty to possess none, except those made of paper, and, as I read this afterwards, I would not have any of any other material. I learnt from our Lord, when I was not thinking at all about this, what I am going to say that this mortification is not right. Which is better, poverty or charity? But as love was the better, whatever kindled love in me, that I must not give up, nor take away from my nuns. 
for the book spoke of much adorning and curious devices, not of pictures. What Satan was doing among the Lutherans was the taking away from them all those means by which their love might be the more quickened, and thus they were going to perdition. Those who are loyal to me, my daughter, must now, more than ever, do the very reverse of what they do. I understood that I was under great obligation to serve Our Lady and St. Joseph, because, when I was utterly lost, God, through their prayers, came and saved me. One day, after the feast of St. Matthew, I was, as is usual with me, after seeing in a vision the Most Holy Trinity, and how it is present in a soul in a state of grace. I understood the mystery most clearly, in such a way that, after a certain fashion and comparisons, I saw it in an imaginary vision, and though at other times I have seen the Most Holy Trinity in an intellectual vision, for some days after, the truth of it did not rest with me, as it does now, I mean, so that I could dwell upon it. I see now that it is just as learned men told me, and I do not understand it as I do now, though I believe them without the least hesitation, for I never had any temptations against the faith. It seems to us ignorant women that the persons of the Most Holy Trinity are all three, as we see them painted, in one person, after the manner of those pictures which represent a body with three faces, and thus it causes such astonishment in us that we look on it as impossible, and so there is nobody who dares to think of it, for the understanding is perplexed, is afraid it may come to doubt the truth, and that robs us of a great blessing. What I have seen is this, three distinct persons, each one by himself visible, and by himself speaking. And afterwards I had been thinking that the Son alone took human flesh, whereby this truth is known. The persons love, communicate, and know themselves. Then, if each one is by himself, how can we say that the three are one essence, and so believe? That is a most deep truth, and I would die for it a thousand times. In the three persons there is but one will, and one power, and one might. Neither can one be without another, so that of all created things, there is but one sole creator. Could the son create an ant without the father? No, because the power is all one. The same is to be said of the Holy Ghost. Thus there is one God Almighty, and the three persons are one majesty. Is it possible to love the Father without loving the Son and the Holy Ghost? No, for he who shall please one of the three pleases the three persons, and he who shall offend one offends all. Can the Father be without the Son and without the Holy Ghost? No, for they are one substance, and where one is, there are the three, for they cannot be divided. How then is it that we see the three persons distinct? And how is it that the Son, not the Father, nor the Holy Ghost, took human flesh? This is what I have never understood. Theologians know it. I know well that the three were there when that marvelous work was done, and I do not busy myself with thinking much thereon. All my thinking thereon comes at once to this, that I see God is almighty, that he has done what he would, and so can do what he will. The less I understand it, the more I believe it, and the greater the devotion it excites in me. May he be blessed for ever. Amen. If our Lord had not been so gracious with me as he has been, I do not think I should have had the courage to do what has been done, nor strength to undergo the labors endured, with the contradictions and the opinions of men. And accordingly, since the beginning of the foundations, I have lost the fears I formerly had, thinking that I was under delusions, and I had a conviction that it was the work of God. Having this, I ventured upon difficult things, though always with advice and under obedience. I see in this, that when our Lord willed to make a beginning of the order, and of his mercy made use of me, his majesty had to supply all that I was deficient in, which was everything, in order that the work might be effected, and that his greatness might be the more clearly revealed in one so wicked. Antiochus was unendurable to himself, 
and to those who were about him, because of the stench of his many sins. Confession is for faults and sins, and not for virtues, nor for anything of the kind relating to prayer. These things are to be treated of, out of confession, with one who understands the matter, and let the prioress see to this. And the nun must understand the straits she is in, in order that the proper helps may be found for her. For Cassian says, that he who does not know the fact, as well as he who has never seen or learnt, that men can swim, will think, when he sees people throw themselves into the river, that they will all be drowned. Our Lord would have Joseph tell the vision to his brethren, and have it known, though it was to cost Joseph so much. How the soul has a sense of fear when God is about to bestow any great grace upon it, that sense is the worship of the spirit, as that of the four elders spoken of in scripture. How, when the faculties are suspended, it is to be understood that certain matters are suggested to the soul, to be by it recommended to God, that an angel suggests them, of whom it is said in the scriptures, that he was burning incense and offering up the prayers of the saints. How there are no sins where there is no knowledge, and thus our Lord did not permit the king to sin with the wife of Abraham, for he thought that she was his sister, not his wife. End of section 5。Section 6 of the Relations of St. Teresa of Avila, translated by David Lewis. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Relation 6. The Vow of Obedience to Father Gratian, which the saint made in 1575. In the year 1575, in the month of April, when I was founding the monastery of Vias, Father Jerome of the Mother of God Gratian happened to come thither. I began to go to confession to him, from time to time, though not looking upon him as filling the place of the other confessors I had so as to be wholly directed by him. One day, when I was taking food, but without any interior recollection whatever, my soul began to be recollected in such a way that I thought I must fall into a trance, and I had a vision that passed away with the usual swiftness, like a meteor. I seemed to see close beside me Jesus Christ our Lord, in the form wherein his majesty is wont to reveal himself, with Father Gratian on his right. Our Lord took his right hand and mine, and joining them together, said to me that he would have me accept him in his place for my whole life, and that we were both to have one mind in all things, for so it was fitting. I was profoundly convinced that this was the work of God, though I remembered with regret two of my confessors, whom I frequented in turn for a long time, and to whom I owed much that one for whom i had a great affection especially caused a terrible resistance nevertheless not being able to persuade myself that the vision was a delusion because it had a great power and influence over me and also because it was said to me on two other occasions that i was not to be afraid that he wished this the words were different i made up my mind at last to act upon them understanding it to be our lord's will and to follow that counsel, so long as I should live. I had never before so acted with any one, though I had consulted many persons of great learning and holiness, and who watched over my soul with great care. But neither had I received any such direction as that I should make no change. For as to my confessors, of some I understood that they would be profitable to me, and so also of these. When I had resolved on this, I found myself in peace and comfort, so great that I was amazed, and assured of our Lord's will, for I do not think that Satan could fill the soul with peace and comfort, such as this. And so, whenever I think of it, I praise our Lord, and remember the words, Posuit fines tuos pacem, and I wish I could wear myself out in the praises of God. It must have been about a month after this, my resolve was made, on the second day after Pentecost, when I was going to found the monastery at Seville, that we heard mass in a hermitage in Exija, 
and rested there during the hottest part of the day. Those who were with me remained in the hermitage, while I was by myself in the sacristy belonging to it. I began to think of one great grace which I received of the Holy Ghost, on one of the vigils of his feast, and a great desire arose within me, of doing him some most special service, and I found nothing that was not already done, at least resolved upon, for all I do must be faulty. And I remembered that, though I had already made a vow of obedience, it might be made in greater perfection, and I had an impression it would be pleasing unto him, if I promised that, which I was already resolved upon, to live under obedience to the Father Master, Friar Jerome. On the one hand, I seemed to be doing nothing, because I was already bent on doing it. On the other hand, it would be a very serious thing, considering that our interior state is not made known to the superiors who receive our vows, and that they change, and that, if one is not doing his work well, another comes in his place. And I believe I should have none of my liberty all my life long, either outwardly or inwardly, and this constrained me greatly to abstain from making the vow. This repugnance of the will made me ashamed, and I saw that, now I had something I could do for God, I was not doing it. It was a sad thing for my resolution to serve him. The fact is, that the objection so pressed me, that I do not think I ever did anything in my life that was so hard, not even my profession, unless it be that of my leaving my father's house to become a nun. The reason of this was that I had forgotten my affection for him, and his gifts for directing me. Yea, rather, I was looking on it then as a strange thing, which has surprised me, feeling nothing but a great fear whether the vow would be for the service of God or not, and my natural self, which is fond of liberty, must have been doing its work, though for years now I have no pleasure in it. But it seemed to me a far other matter to give up that liberty by a vow, as in truth it is. After a protracted struggle, our Lord gave me great confidence, and I saw it was the better course, the more I felt about it. If I made this promise in honor of the Holy Ghost, he would be bound to give him light, for the direction of my soul, and I remembered at the same time that our Lord had given him to me as my guide. Thereupon I fell upon my knees, and, to render this tribute of service to the Holy Ghost, I made a promise to do whatever he should bid me do, while I lived, provided nothing were required of me, contrary to the law of God, and the commands of superiors, whom I am more bound to obey. I advert to this, that the obligation did not extend to things of little importance, for if I were to be importunate with him about anything, and he bade me cease, and I neglected his advice and repeated my request, nor to things relating to my convenience. In a word, his commands were not to be about trifles, done without reflection, and I was not knowingly to conceal from him my faults and sins, or my interior state, and this too is more than we allow to superiors. In a word, I promised to regard him as in the place of God, outwardly and inwardly. I know not if it be so, but I seem to have done a great thing in honor of the Holy Ghost. At least, it was all I could do, and very little it was in comparison with what I owe him. I give God thanks, who has created one capable of this work. I have the greatest confidence that his majesty will bestow on him great graces, and I myself am so happy and joyous, that I seem to be in every way free from myself, and though I thought that my obedience would be a burden, I have attained to the greatest freedom. May our Lord be praised for ever. End of section 6section seven of the relations of saint teresa of avila translated by david lewis this librivox recording is in the public domain relation seven made for rodrigo alvarez s j in the year fifteen seventy five according to don vicente de la fuente but in fifteen seventy six according to the bolandis and father billu 
This nun took the habit forty years ago, and from the first began to reflect on the mysteries of the Passion of Christ our Lord, and on her own sins, for some time every day, without thinking at all of anything supernatural, but only of created things, or of such subjects as suggested to her how soon the end of all things must come, discerning in creatures the greatness of God and his love for us. This made her much more willing to serve him. She was never under the influence of fear, and made no account of it, but had always a great desire to see God honored and his glory increased. To that end were all her prayers directed, without making any for herself, for she thought it mattered little if she had to suffer in purgatory in exchange for the increase of his glory even in the slightest degree. In this she spent about two and twenty years in great aridities, and never did it enter into her thoughts to desire anything else, for she regarded herself as one who, she thought, did not deserve even to think about God, except that his majesty was very merciful to her in allowing her to remain in his presence, saying her prayers, reading also in good books. It must be about eighteen years since she began to arrange about the first monastery of barefooted Carmelites, which she founded. It was in Avila, three or two years before, I believe it is three, she began to think that she occasionally heard interior locutions, and had visions and revelations interiorly. She saw with the eyes of the soul, for she never saw anything with her bodily eyes, nor heard anything with her bodily ears. Twice, she thinks, she heard a voice, but she understood not what was said. It was a sort of making things present when she saw these things interiorly. They passed away like a meteor most frequently. The vision, however, remained so impressed on her mind and produced such effects that it was as if she saw those things with her bodily eyes and more. She was then by nature so very timid that she would not dare to be alone even by day at times. And as she could not escape from these visitations, though she tried with all her might, she went about in very great distress, afraid that it was a delusion of Satan, and began to consult spiritual men of the Society of Jesus about it, among whom were Father Araras, who was commissary of the Society, and who happened to go to that place, and Father Francis, who was Duke of Gandia, him she consulted twice, also a provincial, now in Rome, called Gil Gonzalez, and him also who was now provincial of Castile, this latter, however, not so often. Father Balthazar Alvarez, who was now rector in Salamanca, and he heard her confession for six years at this time. Also the present rector of Cuenca, Salazar by name, the rector of Segovia, called Santander. The rector of Burgos, whose name is Ripalda, and he thought very ill of her when he heard these things, till after he had conversed with her. The Dr. Paul Hernandez in Toledo, who was a consultor of the Inquisition, him who was rector in Salamanca when she talked to him. The Dr. Gutierrez and other fathers, some of the society, whom she knew to be spiritual men, these she sought out, if any were in those places where she went to found monasteries. With the father friar Peter of Alcantara, who was a holy man of the barefooted friars of St. Francis, she had many communications, and he it was, who insisted so much upon it, that her spirit should be regarded as good. They were more than six years trying her spirit minutely, as it is already described at very great length, as will be shown hereafter, and she herself in tears and deep affliction. For the more they tried her, the more she fell into raptures and into trances very often, not, however, deprived of her senses. Many prayers were made, and many masses were said, that our Lord would lead her by another way, for her fear was very great when she was not in prayer, though in everything relating to the state of her soul she was very much better, and a great difference was visible. There was no vainglory, nor had she any temptation thereto, nor to pride. On the contrary, she was very much ashamed and confounded when she saw that people knew of her state, and except with her confessors, or any one who would give her light, she never spoke of these things, and it was more painful to speak of them than if they had been grave sins, for it seemed to her that people must laugh at her, 
and that these things were womanish imaginations, which she had always heard of with disgust. About thirteen years ago, more or less, after the house of St. Joseph was founded, into which she had gone from the other monastery, came the present bishop of Salamanca, inquisitor, I think, of Toledo, previously of Seville, Soto by name. She contrived to have a conference with him for her greater security, and told him everything. He replied that there was nothing in all this that concerned his office, because everything that she saw and heard confirmed her the more in the Catholic faith, in which she always was and is firm, with most earnest desires for the honor of God and the good of souls, willing to suffer death many times for one of them. He told her, when he saw how distressed she was, to give an account of it all, and of her whole life, without omitting anything, to the master Avila, who was a man of great learning in the way of prayer, and to rest content with the answer he should give. She did so, and described her sins and her life. He wrote to her and comforted her, giving her great security. The account I gave was such that all those learned men who saw it, they were my confessors, said that it was very profitable for instruction in spiritual things, and they commanded her to make copies of it, and write another little book for her daughters. She was prioress, wherein she might give them some instructions. Notwithstanding all this, she was not without fear at times, for she thought that spiritual men might also be deceived like herself. She told her confessor that he might discuss these things with certain learned men, though they were not much given to prayer, for she had no other desire but that of knowing whether what she experienced was in conformity with the sacred writings or not. Now and then she took comfort in thinking that, though she herself, because of her sins, deserved to fall into delusions, our Lord would not suffer so many good men, anxious to give her light, to be led into error. Having this in view, she began to communicate with fathers of the order of the glorious St. Dominic, to which, before these things took place, she had been to confession. She does not say to them, but to the order. These are they with whom she afterwards had relations. The father friar Vincent Baron, at that time consultor of the Holy Office, heard her confessions for eighteen months in Toledo and he had done so very many years before these things began. He was a very learned man. He reassured her greatly, as did also the fathers of the society spoken of before. All used to say, if she does not sin against God, and acknowledges her own misery, what has she to be afraid of? She confessed to the father friar Pedro Ibanez, who was reader in Avila, to the father master friar Dominic Banez, who is now in Valladolid, as the rector of the College of St. Gregory. I confessed for six years, and when I had occasion to do so, communicated with him by letter. Also to the Master Chavez, to the Father Master Friar Bartholomew of Medina, professor in Salamanca, of whom she knew that he thought ill of her. For she, having heard this, thought that he, better than any other, could tell her if she was deceived, because he had so little confidence in her. This was more than two years ago. She contrived to go to confession to him, and gave him a full account of everything while she remained there, and he saw what she had written, for the purpose of attaining to a better understanding of the matter. He reassured her so much, and more than all the rest, and remained her very good friend. She went to confession also to Friar Philip de Meneses, when she founded the monastery of Valladolid, for he was rector of the College of St. Gregory. He, having before that heard of her state, had gone to Avila, that he might speak to her. It was an act of great charity, being desirous of ascertaining whether she was deluded, so that he might enlighten her, and, if she was not, defend her when he heard her spoken against, and he was much satisfied. She also conferred particularly with Salinas, Dominican provincial, a man of great spirituality, with another licentiate named Lunar, who was prior of St. Thomas of Avila, and in Segovia, with a reader, Friar Diego de Yanges. Of these Dominicans, some never failed to give themselves greatly to prayer, and perhaps all did. Some others also she consulted, 
for in so many years and because of the fear she was in she had opportunities of doing so especially as she went about founding monasteries in so many places her spirit was tried enough for everybody wished to be able to enlighten her and thereby reassured her in themselves she always at all times wished to submit herself to whatever they enjoined her and she was therefore distressed when as to these spiritual things she could not obey them both her own prayer and that of the nuns she has established are always carefully directed towards the propagation of the faith and it was for that purpose and for the good of her order that she began her first monastery she used to say that if any of these things tended to lead her against the catholic faith and the law of god she would not need to seek for learned men nor tests because she would see at once that they came from satan she never undertook anything merely because it came to her in prayer on the contrary when her confessors bade her do the reverse she did so without being in the least troubled thereat and she always told them everything for all that they told her that these things came from god she never so thoroughly believed them that she could swear it to herself though it did seem to her that they were spiritually safe because of the effects thereof and of the great graces which she had at times received but she always desired virtues more than anything else and this it is that she has changed her nuns to desire saying to them that the most humble and mortified will be the most spiritual all that is told and written she communicated to the father master friar dominic bañez who is now in valladolid and who is the person with whom she had had and has still the most frequent communications he sent her writings to the holy office in madrid so it is said in all this she submits herself to the catholic faith and the roman church nobody has found fault with them because these things are not in the power of any man and our lord does not require what is impossible the reason why so much is known about her is that as she was in fear about herself and described her state to so many these talked to another on the subject and also the accident that happened to what she had written this has been to her a very grievous torment and cross and has cost her many tears she says that this distress is not the effect of humility but of the causes already mentioned our lord seems to have given permission for this torture for if one spoke more harshly of her than others by little and little he spoke more kindly of her she took the greatest pains not to submit the state of her soul to any one who she thought would believe these things came from god for she was instantly afraid that the devil would deceive them both if she saw any one timid about these things to him she laid bare her secrets with the greater joy though also it gave her pain when for the purpose of trying her these things were treated with contempt for she thought some were really from god and she would not have people even if they had good cause condemn them so absolutely neither would she have them believe that all were from god and because she knew perfectly well that delusion was possible therefore it was that she never thought herself altogether safe in a matter wherein there might be danger she used to strive with all her might never in any way to offend god and was always obedient and by these means she thought she might obtain her deliverance by the help of god even if satan were the cause ever since she became subject to these supernatural visitations her spirit is always inclined to seek after that which is most perfect and she had almost always a great desire to suffer and in the persecutions she underwent and they were many she was comforted and had a particular affection for her persecutors she had a great desire to be poor and lonely and to depart out of this land of exile in order to see god through these effects and others like them she began to find peace thinking that a spirit which could leave her with these virtues could not be an evil one and they who had the charge of her soul said so but it was a peace that came from diminished weariness not from the cessation of fear the spirit she is of never urged her to make any of these things known but to be always obedient as it has already been said she never saw anything with her bodily eyes but in a way so subtle and so intellectual that at first she sometimes thought that all was the effect of imagination 
at other times she could not think so these things are not continual but occurred for the most part when she was in some trouble as on one occasion when for some days she had to bear unendurable interior pains and a restlessness of soul arising out of the fear that she was deluded by satan as it is described at length in the account she has given of it and where her sins for they have been so public are mentioned with the rest for the fear she was in made her forget her own good name being thus in distress such as cannot be described at the mere hearing interiorly these words it is i be not afraid her soul became so calm courageous and confident that she could not understand whence so great a blessing had come for her confessor had not been able and many learned men with many words had not been able to give her that peace and rest which this one word had given her and thus at other times some vision gave her strength for without that she could not have borne such trials and contradictions together with infirmities without number and which she still has to bear though they are not so many for she is never free from some suffering or other more or less intense her ordinary state is constant pain with many other infirmities though since she became a nun they are more troublesome if she is doing anything in the service of our lord and the mercies he shows her pass quickly out of memory though she often dwells on those mercies but she is not able to dwell so long upon these as upon her sins these are always a torment to her most commonly as filth smelling foully that her sins are so many and her service of god so scanty must be the reason why she is not tempted to vainglory there never was anything in any of these spiritual visitations that was not wholly pure and clean nor does she think it can be otherwise if the spirit be good and the vision supernatural for she utterly neglects the body and never thinks of it being wholly intent upon god she is also living in great fear about sinning against god and doing his will in all things this is her continual prayer and she is she thinks so determined never to swerve from this that there is nothing her confessors might enjoin her which she considers to be for the greater honor of our lord that she would not undertake and perform by the help of our lord and confident that his majesty helps those who have resolved to advance his service and glory she thinks no more of herself and of her own progress in comparison with that than if she did not exist so far as she knows herself and her confessors think so too all that is written in this paper is the simple truth and they and all others who have had anything to do with her for these twenty years can justify it most frequently her spirit urged her to praise god and she wished that all the world gave itself up to that even though it should cost her exceedingly hence the desire she has for the good of souls and from considering how vile are the things of this world and how precious are interior things with which nothing can be compared she has attained to a contempt of the world as for the vision about which you my father wish to know something it is of this kind she sees nothing either outwardly or inwardly for the vision is not imaginary but without seeing anything she understands what it is and where it is more clearly than if she saw it only nothing in particular presents itself to her she is like a person who feels that another is close beside her but because she is in the dark she sees him not yet is certain that he is there present still this comparison is not exact for he who is in the dark in some way or other through hearing a noise or having seen that person before knows he is there or knew it before but here there is nothing of the kind for without a word inward or outward the soul clearly perceives who it is where he is and occasionally what he means why or how she perceives it she knoweth not but so it is and while it lasts she cannot help being aware of it and when it is over though she may wish ever so much to retain the image thereof she cannot do it for it is then clear to her that it would be in that case an act of the imagination not the vision itself that is not in her power and so it is with the supernatural things and it is from this that it comes to pass that he in whom god works these graces despises himself 
and becomes more humble than he was ever before, for he sees that this is a gift of God, and that he can neither add to it nor take from it. The love and the desire become greater of serving our Lord, who is so mighty that he can do that which is more than our imagination can conceive here, as there are things which men, however learned they may be, can never know. Blessed for ever and ever be he who bestows this. Amen. End of section 7. Section 8 of the Relations of St. Teresa of Avila, translated by David Lewis. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Relation 8, addressed to Father Rodrigo Alvarez. These interior things of the spirit are so difficult to describe, and still more, in such a way as to be understood, the more so as they pass quickly away, that, if obedience did not help me, it would be a chance if I succeeded, especially in such difficult things. I implore you, my father, to take for granted that it is not in my mind to think this to be correct, for it may well be that I do not understand the matter. But what I can assure you of is this, that I will speak of nothing I have not had experience of at times, and indeed often. I think it will please you, my father, if I begin by discussing that which is at the root of supernatural things, for that which relates to devotion, tenderness, tears, and meditations, which is in our power here to acquire by the help of our Lord, is understood. The first prayer of which I was conscious, in my opinion, supernatural, so I call that which no skill or effort of ours, however much we labor, can attain to, though we should prepare ourselves for it, and that preparation must be of great service, is a certain interior recollection of which the soul is sensible. The soul seems to have other senses within itself, then, which bear some likeness to the exterior senses it possesses, and thus the soul, withdrawing into itself, seeks to go away from the tumult of its outward senses, and accordingly it drags them away with itself for it closes the eyes on purpose, that it may neither see, nor hear, nor understand anything, but that whereon the soul is then intent, which is to be able to converse with God alone. In this prayer there is no suspension of the faculties and powers of the soul, it retains the full use of them, but the use of them is retained, that they may be occupied with God. This will be easily understood by him, whom our Lord shall have raised to this state, but by him whom he has not, not. At least, such a one will have need of many words and illustrations. Out of this recollection grow a certain quietude and inward peace, most full of comfort, for the soul is in such a state that it does not seem to it that it wants anything, for even speaking wearies it. I mean by this, vocal prayer and meditation, it would do nothing but love this lasts some time and even a long time out of this prayer comes usually what is called a sleep of the faculties but they are not so absorbed nor so suspended as that it can be called a trance nor is it altogether union sometimes and even often the soul is aware that the will alone is in union and this it sees very clearly that is it seems so to it the will is wholly intent upon God, and the soul sees that it has no power to rest on, or do, anything else. And at the same time the two other faculties are at liberty to attend to other matters of the service of God. In a word, Martha and Mary are together. I asked Father Francis if this was a delusion, for it made me stupid, and his reply was that it often happened. When all the faculties of the soul are in union, it is a very different state of things, for they can then do nothing whatever, because the understanding is, as it were, surprised. The will loves more than the understanding knows, but the understanding does not know that the will loves, nor what it is doing, so as to be able in any way to speak of it. As to the memory, the soul, I think, has none then, nor any power of thinking, nor are the senses awake, 
but rather as lost, so that the soul may be the more occupied with the object of its fruition, so it seems to me. They are lost but for a brief interval, it passes quickly away. By the wealth of humility and the other virtues and desires, left in the soul, after this may be learnt, how great the blessing is that flows from this grace, but it cannot be told what it is. For, though the soul applies itself in the understanding of it, it can neither understand nor explain it. This, if it be true, is, in my opinion, the greatest grace wrought by our Lord on this spiritual road. At least, it is one of the greatest. Raptures and trances, in my opinion, are all one. Only I am in the habit of using the word trance instead of rapture, because the latter word frightens people. And, indeed, the union of which I am speaking may also be called a trance. The difference between union and trance is this, that the latter lasts longer and is more visible outwardly, because the breathing gradually diminishes, so that it becomes impossible to speak or to open the eyes. And though this very thing occurs when the soul is in union, there is more violence in a trance, for the natural warmth vanishes, I know not how, when the rapture is deep. And in all these kinds of prayer, there is more or less of this. When it is deep, as I was saying, the hands become cold, and sometimes stiff and straight as pieces of wood. As to the body, if the rapture comes on when it is standing or kneeling, it remains so, and the soul is so full of the joy of that which our Lord is setting before it, that it seems to forget to animate the body, and abandons it. If the rapture lasts, the nerves are made to feel it. It seems to me that our Lord will have the soul no more of that, the fruition of which it has, in a trance than in a union, and accordingly, in a rapture, the soul receives most commonly certain revelations of his majesty, and the effects thereof on the soul are great, a forgetfulness of self, through the longing it has that God our Lord, who is so high, may be known and praised. In my opinion, if the rapture be from God, the soul cannot fail to obtain a deep conviction of its own helplessness, and of its wretchedness and ingratitude, in that it has not served him who, of his own goodness only, bestows upon it graces so great. For the feeling and the sweetness are so high above all things, that may be compared therewith, that, if the recollection of them did not pass away, all the satisfactions of earth would be always loathsome to it, and hence comes the contempt for all the things of the world. The difference between trance and transport is this. In a trance, the soul gradually dies to outward things, losing the senses and living unto God. A transport comes on by one sole act of his majesty, wrought in the innermost part of the soul, with such swiftness, that it is as if the higher part thereof were carried away, and the soul leaving the body. Accordingly, it requires courage at first, to throw itself into the arms of our Lord, that he may take it whithersoever he will. For, until his majesty establishes it in peace there, whither he is pleased to take it, by take it I mean the admitting of it to the knowledge of deep things, it certainly requires in the beginning to be firmly resolved to die for him, because the poor soul does not know what this means, that is, at first. The virtues, as it seems to me, remain stronger after this, for there is a growth in detachment, and the power of God, who is so mighty, is the more known, so that the soul loves and fears him. For so it is, he carries away the soul, no longer in our power, as the true Lord thereof, which is filled with a deep sorrow for having offended him, and astonishment that it ever dared to offend a majesty so great, with an exceedingly earnest desire, that none may henceforth offend him, and that all may praise him. This, I think, must be the source of those very fervent desires for the salvation of souls, and for some share therein, and for the due praising of God. The flight of the soul, I know not how to call it, is a rising upwards from the very depths of the soul. I remember only this comparison, and I made use of it before, as you know, my father, in that writing where these and other things of prayer are explained at length. And such is my memory that I forget things at once. It seems to me that soul and spirit are one and the same, 
but only as a fire, if it is great and ready for burning. So, like fire burning rapidly, the soul, in that preparation of itself, which is the work of God, sends up a flame. The flame ascends on high, but the fire thereof is the same as that below, nor does the flame cease to be fire, because it ascends. So here, in the soul, something so subtle and so swift, seems to issue from it, that ascends to the higher part, and goes thither whither our Lord wills. I cannot go further with the explanation. It seems a flight, and I know of nothing else wherewith to compare it. I know that it cannot be mistaken, for it is most evident when it occurs, and that it cannot be hindered. This little bird of the spirit seems to have escaped out of this wretchedness of the flesh, out of the prison of this body, and now, disentangled therefrom, is able to be the more intent on that which our Lord is giving it. The flight of the spirit is something so fine, of such inestimable worth, as the soul perceives it, that all delusion therein seems impossible, or anything of the kind, when it occurs. It was afterwards that fear arose, because she who received this grace was so wicked, for she saw what good reason she had to be afraid of everything, though in her innermost soul there remained an assurance and a confidence wherein she was able to live, but not enough to make her cease from the anxiety she was in, not to be deceived. By impetus I mean, that desire which at times rushes into the soul, without being preceded by prayer, and that is most frequently the case. It is a sudden remembering that the soul is away from God, or of a word it has heard to that effect. This remembering is occasionally so strong and vehement, that the soul in a moment becomes as if the reason were gone, just like a person who suddenly hears most painful tidings of which he knew not before, or is surprised. Such a one seems deprived of the power of collecting his thoughts for his own comfort, and is as one lost. So it is in this state, except that the suffering arises from this, that there abides in the soul a conviction that it would be well worth dying in it. It seems that whatever the soul then perceives, does but increase its suffering, and that our Lord will have its whole being find no comfort in anything, nor remember that it is his will that it should live. The soul seems to itself to be in great and indescribable loneliness, and abandoned of all, because the world, and all that is in it, gives it pain. And because it finds no companionship in any created thing, the soul seeks its creator alone, and this it sees to be impossible unless it dies, and as it must not kill itself, it is dying to die, and there is really a risk of death, and it sees itself hanging between heaven and earth, not knowing what to do with itself. And from time to time God gives it a certain knowledge of himself, that it may see what it loses, in a way so strange that no explanation of it is possible. And there is no pain in the world, at least I have felt none, that is equal or like unto this. For if it lasts but half an hour, the whole body is out of joint, and the bones so racked, that I am unable to write with my hands. The pains I endure are most grievous. But nothing of this is felt, till the impetus shall have passed away. He to whom it comes has enough to do in enduring that which is going on within him, nor do I believe that he would feel if he were grievously tortured. He is in possession of all his senses, can speak and even observe. Walk about he cannot. The great blow of that love throws him down to the ground. If we were to die to have this, it would be of no use, for it cannot be except when God sends it. It leaves great effects and blessings in the soul. Some learned men say that it is this, others that it is that, but no one condemns it. The master father de Avila wrote to me and said it was good, and so say all. The soul clearly understands that it is a great grace from our Lord. Were it to occur more frequently, life would not last long. The ordinary impetus is that this desire of serving God comes on with a certain tenderness, accompanied with tears, out of a longing to depart from this land of exile. But as the soul retains its freedom, wherein it reflects that its living on is according to our Lord's will, 
it takes comfort in that thought and offers its life to him beseeching him that it may last only for his glory this done it bears all another prayer very common is a certain kind of wounding for it really seems to the soul as if an arrow were thrust through the heart or through itself thus it causes great suffering which makes the soul complain but the suffering is so sweet that it wishes it never would end the suffering is not of one sense neither is the wound physical it is in the interior of the soul without any appearance of bodily pain but as i cannot explain it except by comparing it with other pains i make use of these clumsy expressions for such they are when applied to this suffering i cannot however explain it in any other way it is therefore neither to be written of nor spoken of because it is impossible for any one to understand it who has not had experience of it i mean how far the pain can go for the pains of the spirit are very different from those of earth i gather therefore from this that the souls in hell and purgatory suffer more than we can imagine by considering these pains of the body at other times this wound of love seems to issue from the inmost depth of the soul great are the effects of it and when our lord does not inflict it there is no help for it whatever we may do to obtain it nor can it be avoided when it is his pleasure to inflict it the effects of it are those longings after god so quick and so fine that they cannot be described and when the soul sees itself hindered and kept back from entering as it desires on the fruition of god it conceives a great loathing for the body on which it looks as a thick wall which hinders it from that fruition which it then seems to have entered upon within itself and unhindered by the body it then comprehends the great evil that has befallen us through the sin of adam in robbing us of this liberty this prayer i had before the raptures and the great impetuosities i had been speaking of i forgot to say that these great impetuosities scarcely ever leave me except through a trance or great sweetness in our lord whereby he comforts the soul and gives it courage to live on for his sake all this that i speak of cannot be the effect of the imagination and i have some reasons for saying this but it would be wearisome to enter on them whether it be good or not is known to our lord the effects thereof and how it profits the soul pass all comprehension as it seems to me i see clearly that the persons are distinct as i saw it yesterday when you my father were talking to the father provincial only i saw nothing and heard nothing as my father i have already told you but there is a strange certainty about it though the eyes of the soul see nothing and when the presence is withdrawn that withdrawal is felt how it is i know not but i do know very well that it is not an imagination because i cannot reproduce the vision when it is over even if i were to perish in the effort but i have tried to do so so it is with all that i have spoken of here so far as i can see for as i have been in this state for so many years i have been able to observe so that i can say so with this confidence the truth is and you my father should attend to this that as to the person who always speaks i can certainly say which of them he seems to me to be of the others i cannot say so much one of them i know well has never spoken i never knew why nor do i busy myself in asking more of god than he is pleased to give because in that case i believe i should be deluded by satan at once nor will i ask now because of the fear i am in i think the first spoke to me at times but as i do not remember that very well now nor what it was that he spoke i will not venture to say so it is all written you my father know where and more at large than it is here i know not whether in the same words or not though the persons are distinct in a strange way the soul knows one only god i do not remember that our lord ever seemed to speak to me but in his human nature and i say it again i can assure you that this is no imagination what my father you say about the water i know not nor have i heard where the earthly paradise is i have already said that i cannot but listen to what our lord tells me 
I hear it because I cannot help myself. But, as for asking his majesty to reveal anything to me, that is what I have never done. In that case, I should immediately think I was imagining things, and that I must be in a delusion of Satan. God be praised, I have never been curious about things, and I do not care to know more than I do. What I have learnt, without seeking to learn, as I have just said, has been a great trouble to me, though it has been the means, I believe, which our Lord made use of to save me, seeing that I was so wicked. Good people do not need so much to make them serve his majesty. I remember another way of prayer, which I had before the one mentioned first, namely, a presence of God, which is not a vision at all. It seems that any one, if he recommends himself to his majesty, even if he only prays vocally, finds him. Every one, at all times, can do this, if we accept seasons of aridity. May he grant, I may not by my own fault lose mercy so great, and may he have compassion on me. End of section 8 Section 9 of the Relations of St. Teresa of Avila Translated by David Lewis. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Relation 9 of certain spiritual graces she received in Toledo and Avila in the years 1576 and 1577. I had begun to go to confession to a certain person in the city wherein I am at present staying, when he, though he had much good will towards me, and always has had since he took upon himself the charge of my soul, ceased to come here. And one night, when I was in prayer, and thinking how he failed me, I understood that God kept him from coming, because it was expedient for me to treat of the affairs of my soul with a certain person on the spot. I was distressed because I had to form new relations. It might be he would not understand me, and would disturb me, and because I had a great affection for him, who did me this charity, though I was always spiritually content when I saw or heard the latter preach. Also, I thought it would not do, because of his many occupations. Our Lord said to me, I will cause him to hear and understand thee. Make thyself known unto him. It will be some relief to thee in thy troubles. The latter part was addressed to me, I think, because I was then so worn out by the absence of God. His majesty also said that he saw very well the trouble I was in. But it could not be otherwise while I lived in this land of exile. All was for my good, and he comforted me greatly. So it has been. He comforts me and seeks opportunities to do so. He has understood me and given me great relief. He is a most learned and holy man." One day, it was the feast of the presentation, I was praying earnestly to God for a certain person, and thinking that after all the possession of property and of freedom was unfitting for that high sanctity which I wished him to attain to. I reflected on his weak health, and on the spiritual health which he communicated to souls, and I heard these words. He serves me greatly, but the great thing is to follow me stripped of everything, as I was on the cross tell him to trust in me. These last words were said because I thought he could not, with his weak health, attain to such perfection. Once, when I was thinking of the pain it was to me to take my food and do no penance, I understood that there was, at times, more of self-love in that feeling than of desire for penance. Once, when I was in great distress because of my offenses against God, he said to me, All thy sins in my sight are as if they were not. For the future, be strong, for thy troubles are not over. One day in prayer, I felt my soul in God in such a way that it seemed to me as if the world did not exist. I was so absorbed in him. He made me then understand that verse of the Magnificat, et exultavit spiritus meus, so that I could never forget it. Once, when I was thinking how people sought to destroy this monastery of the barefooted Carmelites, and that they purposed, perhaps, to bring about the destruction of them all by degrees, I heard, They do purpose it. Nevertheless, they will never see it done, but very much the reverse. 
Once, in deep recollection, I was praying to God for Elysius. I heard this. He is my true son. I will never fail him. Or to that effect. But I am not sure of the latter words. Having one day conversed with a person who had given up much for God, and calling to mind that I had given up nothing for him, and had never served him in anything, as I was bound to do, and then considering the many graces he had wrought in my soul, I began to be exceedingly weary, and our Lord said to me, Thou knowest of the betrothal between thee and myself, and therefore all I have is thine, and so I give thee all the labors and sorrows I endured, and thou canst therefore ask of my father as if they were thine. Though I have heard that we are partakers therein, now it was in a way so different that it seemed as if I had become possessed of a great principality. For the affection with which he wrought this grace cannot be described. The father seemed to ratify the gift, and from that time forth I look at our Lord's passion in a very different light, as on something that belongs to me, and that gives me great comfort. On the feast of the Magdalene, when thinking of the great love I am bound to have for our Lord, according to the words he spoke to me in reference to this saint, and having great desires to imitate her, our Lord was very gracious unto me, and said, I was to be henceforward strong, for I had to serve him more than I had hitherto done. He filled me with a desire not to die so soon, that I might have the time to occupy myself therein, and I remained with a great resolution to suffer. On one occasion, I understood how our Lord was in all things, and how he was in the soul, and the illustration of a sponge filled with water was suggested to me. When my brothers came, and I owe so much to one of them, I remained in conversation with him concerning his soul and his affairs, which wearied and distressed me. And as I was offering this up to our Lord, and thinking that I did it, all because I was under obligations to him, I remember that by our constitutions we are commanded to separate ourselves from our kindred, and I was set thinking whether I was under any obligation. Our Lord said to me, No, my daughter, the regulations of the order must be only in conformity with my law. The truth is, that the end of the constitutions is, that we are not to be attached to our kindred, and to converse with them, as it seems to me, is rather wearisome, and it is painful to have anything to do with them. After communion on St. Augustine's day, I understood, and as it were saw, I cannot tell how, unless it was by an intellectual vision which passed rapidly away, how the three persons of the Most Holy Trinity, whom I have always imprinted on my soul, are one. This was revealed in a representation so strange, and in a light so clear, that the impression made upon me is very different from that which I have by faith. From that time forth, I have never been able to think of one of the three divine persons without thinking of the three, so that today, when I was considering how, the three being one, the Son alone took our flesh upon him, our Lord showed me how, though they are one, they are also distinct. These are marvels which make the soul desire anew, to be rid of the hindrance which the body interposes between it and the fruition of them. Though this passes away in a moment, there remains a gain to the soul, incomparably greater than any it might have made, by meditation during many years, and all without knowing how it happens. I have a special joy on the feast of Our Lady's Nativity. When this day was come, I thought it would be well to renew our vows, and thereupon I saw Our Lady by an illuminative vision, and it seems as if we made them before her, and that they were pleasing unto her. I had this vision constantly for some days, and Our Lady was by me on my left hand. One day, after communion, it seemed to me that my soul was really one with the most holy body of our Lord, then present before me, and that wrought a great work and blessing in me. I was once thinking whether I was to be sent to reform a certain monastery, and distressed at it, I heard. What art thou afraid of? What canst thou lose? Only thy life, which thou hast so often offered to me, I will help thee. This was in prayer, which was of such a nature as to ease my soul exceedingly. 
once having a desire to render some service to our lord i considered that i could serve him but poorly and said to myself why o lord dost thou desire my works he answered to see thy good will my child once our lord gave me light in a matter that i was very glad to understand and i immediately forgot it so that i was never able to call it again to mind and so when i was trying to remember it i heard thou knowest now that i speak to thee from time to time do not omit to write down what i say for though it may not profit thee it may be that it will profit others as i was thinking whether i for my sins had to be of use to others and be lost myself he said to me have no fear i was once recollected in that companionship which i ever have in my soul and it seems to me that god was present therein in such a way that i remembered how saint peter said thou art christ the son of the living god for the living god was in my soul this is not like other visions for it overpowers faith so that it is impossible to doubt of the indwelling of the trinity in our souls by presence power and essence to know this truth is of the very highest gain and as i stood amazed to see his majesty in a thing so vile as my soul i heard it is not vile my child for it is made in my image i also learnt something of the reason why god delights in souls more than in any other creatures it is so subtle that though the understanding quickly comprehended it i cannot tell it when i was in such distress because of the troubles of our father that i had no rest and after communion one day was making most earnestly my petition to our lord that as he had given him to me i might not lose him he said to me have no fear once with that presence of the three persons which i have in my soul i was in light so clear that no doubt of the presence of the true and living god was possible and i then came to the knowledge of things which afterwards i could not speak of one of these things was how the person of the son only took human flesh i cannot as i have just said explain it all for some of these things were wrought in the secret recesses of the soul and the understanding seems to grasp them only as one who is in his sleep or half awake thinks he comprehends what is told him i was thinking how hard it was to remain alive seeing that it was living on that robbed us of that marvellous companionship and so i said to myself o oh lord show me some way whereby i may bear this life he said unto me think my child when life is over thou canst not serve me as thou art serving me now and eat for me and sleep for me whatsoever thou doest let it be done for me as if thou wert no longer living but i for that is what st paul said once after communion i saw how his father within our soul accepts the most holy body of christ i have understood and seen how the divine persons are there and how pleasing is this offering of his son because he has his joy and delight in him so to speak here on earth for it is not the humanity only that is with us in our souls but the divinity as well and thus is it so pleasing and acceptable unto him and gives us graces so great i understood also that he accepts the sacrifice though the priest be in sin but then the grace of it is not communicated to his soul as it is to their souls who are in a state of grace not that the inflowings of grace which proceed from this communion wherein the father accepts the sacrifice cease to flow in their strength but because of his fault who has to receive them as it is not the fault of the sun that it does not illumine a lump of pitch when its rays strike it as it illumines a globe of crystal if i could now describe it i should be better understood it is a great matter to know this because there are grand secrets within us when we are at communion it is sad that these bodies of ours do not allow us to have the fruition thereof during the octave of all saints i had two or three days of exceeding anguish the result of my remembrance of my great sins and i was also in great dread of persecutions which had no foundation except that great accusations were brought against me and all my resolutions to suffer anything for god failed me though i sought to encourage myself and made corresponding acts 
and saw that all would be a great gain for me. It was to little purpose, for the fear never left me. It was a sharp warfare. I came across a letter, in which my good father had written that St. Paul said, that God does not suffer us to be tempted beyond our power to bear. This was a great relief to me, but it was not enough. Yea, rather on the next day, I was in great distress at his absence, for I had no one to go to in this trouble, for I seemed to be living in great loneliness. And it added to my grief, to see that I find no one but he who can comfort me, and he must be more than ever away, which is a very sore trouble. The next night after this, reading in a book, I found another saying of St. Paul, with which I began to be comforted, and being slightly recollected, I remained thinking how I had our Lord before present within me, so that I truly saw him to be the living God. While thinking on this he spoke to me, and I saw him in my inmost being, as it were, beside my heart, and in an intellectual vision. His words were, I am here, only I will have thee see how little thou canst do without me. I was on the instant reassured, and all my fears left me. And while at matins that very night, our Lord himself, in an intellectual vision, so clear as to seem almost imaginary, laid himself in my arms, as he is painted in the pictures of Our Lady of Anguish. The vision made me very much afraid, for it was so clear and so close to me, that it made me think whether it was an illusion or not. He said to me, Be not afraid of it, for the union of my father with thy soul is incomparably closer than this. The vision has remained with me till now. What I have said of our Lord continued more than a month, now it has left me. I was one night in great distress, because it was then a long time since I had heard anything of my father, and moreover, he was not well the last time he wrote to me. However, my distress was not so great as that I felt before, for I had hopes, and distress like that I never was in sense, but still my anxiety hindered my prayer. He appeared to me on the instant, it could not have been the effect of imagination, for I saw a light within me, and himself coming by the way joyous, with a face all fair. It must have been the light I saw that made his face fair, for all the saints in heaven seemed so, and I considered whether it be the light and splendor proceeding from our Lord that renders them thus fair. I heard this. Tell him to begin at once without fear, for the victory is his." One day after he came, when I was at night giving thanks to our Lord, for the many mercies he had given unto me, he said to me, O oh, my child, what canst thou ask that I have not done? Our Lord said to me one day, in the monastery of Vias, that I was to present my petition to him, for I was his bride. He promised to grant whatever I might ask of him, and, as a pledge, gave me a very beautiful ring, with a stone set in it like an amethyst, but of a brilliancy very unlike, which he put on my finger. I write this to my own confusion, considering the goodness of God and my wretched life, for I have deserved hell. Ah, my daughters, pray to God for me, and be devout to St. Joseph, who can do much. This folly I write, folly I write." On the eve of St. Lawrence, at communion, I was so distracted and dissipated in mind, that I had no power over it, and began to envy those who dwell in desert places, thinking that, as they see and hear nothing, they are exempt from distractions. I heard this. Thou art greatly deceived, my daughter. On the contrary, the temptations of Satan are more violent there. Have patience. While life lasts, it cannot be helped." While dwelling on this, I became suddenly recollected, and saw a great light within me, so that I thought I was in another world, and my spirit found itself interiorly in a forest, and in a garden of delights, which made me remember those words of the canticle, Veniat delectus meus, in hortum suum. I saw my Elysius there, not at all swarthy, but in strange beauty. Around his head was a garland of precious stones, a multitude of damsels went before him, with palms in their hands, all singing hymns of praise unto God. I did nothing but open my eyes, to see whether I could not distract myself from the vision, 
but that failed to divert my attention, and I thought there was music also, the singing of birds and of angels, which filled my soul with joy, though I did not hear any. My soul was in joy, and did not consider that there was nobody else there. I heard these words. He has merited to be among you, and all this rejoicing which thou beholdest, will take place on the day he shall set aside for the honor of my mother. And do thou make haste, if thou wouldest reach the place where he is. This vision lasted more than an hour and a half. In this respect, differently from my other visions, I could not turn away from it, and it filled me with delight. The effect of the vision was a great affection for Elysius, and a more frequent thinking of him in that beauty. I have had a fear of its being a temptation, for the work of the imagination it could not possibly be. The day after the presentation of the brief, as I was in the most eager expectation, which utterly disturbed me, so that I could not even pray, for I had been told that our father was in great straits because they would not let him come away, and that there was a great tumult, I heard these words, O oh, woman of little faith, be quiet, everything is going on perfectly well. It was the feast of the presentation of Our Lady, in the year 1575. I resolved within myself, if Our Lady obtained from her Son, that we might see ourselves and our Father free of these friars, to ask him to order the solemn celebration of that feast, every year, in our monasteries of the barefooted Carmelites. When I made this resolution, I did not remember what I had heard in a former vision, that he would establish this solemnity. Now, in reading again this little paper, I think this must be the feast referred to. End of section 9。section 10 of the Relations of St. Teresa of Avila, translated by David Lewis. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Relation 10 of a relation to the saint at Avila, 1579, and of certain directions concerning the government of the order. In St. Joseph of Avila, on Pentecost Eve, in the hermitage of Nazareth, thinking of one of the greatest graces our Lord had given me on that day, some twenty years before, more or less, my spirit was vehemently stirred and grew hot within me, and I fell into a trance. In that profound recollection, I heard our Lord say what I am now going to tell. I was to say to the barefooted fathers, as from him, that they must strive to observe four things, and that so long as they observed them, the order would increase more and more, and if they neglected them, they should know that they were falling away from their first estate. The first is, the superiors of the monasteries are to be of one mind. The second even if they have many monasteries, to have but few friars in each. The third, to converse little with people in the world, and that only for the good of their souls. The fourth, to teach more by works than by words. This happened in the year 1579, and because it is a great truth, I have put my name to it. Teresa de Jesus. End of section 10. Section 11 of the Relations of St. Teresa of Avila, translated by David Lewis. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Relation 11. Written from Palencia in May 1581, and addressed to Don Alonso Velasquez, Bishop of Osma, who had been, when canon of Toledo, one of the saint's confessors. Jesus. Oh, that I could clearly explain to your lordship the peace and quiet my soul has found, for it has so great a certainty of the fruition of God, that it seems to be as if already in possession, though the joy is withheld. I am as one to whom another has granted by deed a large revenue, into the enjoyment and use of which he is to come at a certain time, but until then has nothing but the right already given him to the revenue." In gratitude for this, my soul would abstain from the joy of it, because it has not deserved it. It wishes only to serve him, 
even if in great suffering, and at times it thinks it would be very little if, till the end of the world, it had to serve him who has given it this right. For, in truth, it is in some measure no longer subject, as before, to the miseries of this world. Though it suffers more, it seems as if only the habit were struck, for my soul is, as it were, in a fortress with authority, and accordingly does not lose its peace. Still this confidence does not remove from it its great fear of offending God, nor make it less careful to put away every hindrance to his service. Yea, rather it is more careful than before. But it is so forgetful of its own interests as to seem, in some measure, to have lost itself, so forgetful of self is it in this. Everything is directed to the honor of God, to the doing of his will, more and more, and the advancement of his glory. Though this be so, yet, in all that relates to health and the care of the body, it seems to me that I am more careful than I was, that I mortify myself less in my food, and do fewer penances. It is not so with the desires I had, they seem to be greater." All this is done that I may be the better able to serve God in other things, for I offer to him very often, as a great sacrifice, the care I take of my body, and that wearies me much, and I try it sometimes in acts of mortification. But, after all, this cannot be done without losing health, and I must not neglect what my superiors command. Herein, and in the wish for health, much self-love also must insinuate itself, but, as it seems to me, I feel that it would give me more pleasure, and it gave me more pleasure when I was strong, to do penance, for, at least, I seemed to be doing something, and was giving a good example, and I was free from the vexation which arises out of the fact that I am not serving God at all. Your Lordship will see what it will be best to do in the matter. The imaginary visions have ceased, but the intellectual visions of the three persons and of the sacred humanity seems ever present, and that, I believe, is a vision of a much higher kind. And I understand now, so I think, that the visions I had came from God, because they prepared my soul for its present state. They were given only because I was so wretched and so weak. God led me by the way which he saw was necessary, but they are, in my opinion, of great worth when they come from God. The interior locutions have not left me, for, whenever it is necessary, our Lord gives me certain directions, and now, in Palencia, were it not for these, there would have been committed a great blunder, though not a sin. The acts and desires do not seem to be so vigorous as they used to be, for, though they are great, I have one much greater, to see the will of God accomplished and his glory increased. For as the soul is well aware that his majesty knoweth what is expedient herein, and is so far removed from all self-seeking, these acts and desires quickly end, and, as it seems to me, have no strength. Hence the fear I have at times, though without disquietude and pain as formerly, that my soul is dulled, and that I am doing nothing, because I can do no penance. Acts of desire for suffering, for martyrdom, and of the vision of God, have no strength in them, and most frequently I cannot make them. I seem to live only for eating and drinking, and avoiding pain in everything, and yet this gives me none, except that sometimes, as I said before, I am afraid that this is a delusion but I cannot believe it, because so far as I can see, I am not under the sway of any strong attachment to any created thing, nor even to all the bliss of heaven, but only to the love of God. And this does not grow less. On the contrary, I believe it is growing, together with the longing that all men may serve him. But, for all this, one thing amazes me. I have not the feelings I had formerly, so strong and so interior, which tormented me when I saw souls go to their ruin, and when I used to think I had offended God. I cannot have these feelings now, though I believe my desire that God be not sinned against is not less than it was. Your Lordship must consider that in all this, in my present as well as in my previous state, I can do no more, and that it is not in my power to serve him better, I might do so, if I were not so wicked. 
I may say also, that if I were now to make great efforts to wish to die, I could not, nor can I make the acts I used to make, nor feel the pains I felt for having offended God, nor the great fears I had for so many years, when I thought I was under a delusion, and accordingly I have no need of learned men, or of speaking to anybody at all, only to satisfy myself that I am going the right road now, and whether I can do anything. I have consulted certain persons on this point, with whom I have taken counsel on the others, with Father Dominic, the Master Medina, and certain members of the society. I will be satisfied with the answer which you, my Lord, may give me, because of the great trust I have in your Lordship. Consider it carefully, for the love of God. Neither do I cease to learn that certain souls of people, connected with me, when they died, are in heaven. Of others, I learn nothing. La soledad que me hace pensar, no se puede dar aquel, sentido a él, que mama los pechos de mi madre, la ida de higuito. I am at peace within, and my likings and dislikings have so little power to take me from the presence of the three persons, of which, while it continues, it is so impossible to doubt, that I seem clearly to know by experience what is recorded by St. John, that God will make his dwelling in the soul, and not only by grace, but because he will have the soul feel that presence, and it brings with it so many blessings, particularly this, that there is no need to run after reflections to learn that God is there. This is almost always the state I am in, except when my great infirmities oppress me. Sometimes God will have me suffer without any inward comfort, but my will never swerves, not even in its first movements, from the will of God. This resignation to his will is so efficacious, that I desire neither life nor death, except for some moments, when I long to see God, and then the presence of the three persons becomes so distinct, as to relieve the pain of the absence, and I wish to live, if such be his good pleasure, to serve him still longer. And if I might help, by my prayers, to make but one soul love him more, and praise him, and that only for a short time, I think that of more importance than to dwell in glory. The unworthy servant and daughter of your lordship, Teresa de Jesus. End of section 11. End of The Relations of St. Teresa Translated by David Lewis.